My name is Mark Thomas. I'm a consultant paediatric anaesthetist at Great Ormond Street Hospital, and with me is Mike Suri. Hello, who's also a consultant paediatric anaesthetist at the same hospital. And uh, we're going today to just take you briefly through 10 minutes or so uh, a podcast that we're putting together on Mike's article in Paediatric Anaesthesia entitled Accidental Awareness During Anaesthesia in Children. So, um, Mike, uh, before we get going properly, perhaps you could just go through, we could go through some of the key learning points that uh, you've brought out in the article. And um, the first one relates to the characteristics being extremely variable. Yeah, well, they are. Um, the most of our information comes from the NAP5 study, and uh, this was a, a key finding that if one is going to say anything about. Um, Arga, as I'm going to call it, uh, accidental awareness during anaesthesia, is is uh, general anaesthesia, is that uh, it could, the, the characteristics could vary from uh, agony and paralysis, uh, which we everybody would be terrified about, to uh, something trivial like hearing a voice, uh, and uh, you know that that's kind of is rather important if we're trying to understand what the importance of the problem is. So uh, given the variable nature, nevertheless the um, incidence is very low in children. Yeah, I, I think if one waited for children to uh, go to the doctors and complain about the uh, accidental awareness, uh, one would, uh, that NAP5 is saying that um, uh, you've got to have 50,000 children come through the door before, before one of them is going to complain spontaneously. So, you know, an incidence of of um, less than one in fifty thousand is really quite rare, uh, but the uh, studies from direct questioning you know, using a a Bryce questionnaire where you ask every child in a in a sequence uh, whether they remembered anything uh, after going off to sleep and before waking up, uh, you're going to get one in thirty five remembering something, uh, which is uh, quite a difference between the two uh, methods. And I can only assume then that um, the one, the much lower incidence in spontaneous reporting relates to perhaps more severe or distressing cases that have lingered in the memory, uh, whereas the Bryce questionnaire teases out the more trivial, I mean no, no, no incidence is trivial of course, but the less distressing uh, uh, cases. Would that be fair or is that uh, a, a leap I, of faith? I, I think that would be a reasonable um, expectation. Um, I don't think the data supports that. The um, fact is that there were only a few cases from NAP5 uh, in children, and uh, uh, what we know from NAP5 really applies to people of any age group, uh, and uh, probably be fair to say that the lessons from NAP5 uh, relate to the kind of drugs, the techniques, the operations that one is with, rather than the age group of the child. Although the age is important, but it's not the dominant factor no. here. So, so that brings us nicely on to risk factors. Would you be able to identify, or are you able to identify risk factors for awareness? I, I, I reckon that well, the, 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 the NAP5 thing and other studies really showing that the use of a neuromuscular blocker is uh, the the factor that's associated with uh, the nasty, uh, distressing cases of of awareness, where the, where the patient is a, is a, is aware in pain and can't move, and, uh, and the psychological upset is uh, is highly likely in that situation. That would be the thing that everybody would really want to avoid, uh, and these things are really around uh, induction and around emergence uh, rather than the in-between period. Uh, so I think that those would be the lessons for anaesthetists to learn, you know, concentrate hard on making sure that the patient is asleep at those times uh, and always, but uh, not to make a mistake at those times. Okay, thanks. Well, we, we'll come on to a few, a few more of the details now. So those are the key learning points. Um, it's, it's very variable in nature, as, you, as you've said, and um, the instance depends upon how you tease out uh, the 
uh, reporting, be it by direct questioning, such as the Bryce method, or um, by spontaneous reporting uh, of historical experiences. I suppose all experiences are historical mm-hmm. when I, when I analyse it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, some children seem to delay reporting. Yeah, I mean, right. so, some, some cases are more historical than others. And uh, uh, in, in NAB5, uh, some of our paediatric cases uh, were actually made by adults. Uh, reporting awareness uh, from when they had been a child, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago in some cases. Uh, and uh, there had been not only decades intervening in the intervening period, uh, but they'd uh, had other anaesthetics uh, in the intervening period. And then making the report of, of awareness for the first time, that, that's, that's what NAP5 uh, looked at. Uh, and that, that was surprising. We had, um, what have I got here? I've got 24 reports in children under the age of 16 in NAP5. Um, Only nine of those could be verified by hospital records. And that's because the others were so long ago uh, that we didn't didn't have solid proof that they'd had an anaesthetic at all. We, We believe them. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, and you know, some of these were not very important or obviously distressing memories, and, and others uh, people were still distressed about them and were frightened of anaesthesia. So it's an interesting uh, okay. uh, observation. Yeah. yeah. So how how can we prevent it in in our in our patients um, if we if we want to uh, keep the incidence even lower than already reported? Well. I would focus, uh, I'd recommend us to focus on the uh, induction period. I think that's a good place to start. Um, and there's a thing called the gap, which is not difficult to imagine. That is, uh, you give an intravenous dose and it may not be quite enough to take you through uh, into uh, the time when you've got enough inhalational agent into the patient to, to keep them asleep. Uh, and if you're transferring the patient from uh, an anaesthetic room into theatre, you know, that's another source of, uh, of error. Uh, and there's patient variation in all this, so it would be easy if you were uh, strict or, or fixed about a single dose uh, to, to get some patients um, into, into that gap and, the, and they're awake. And by inference there, I suppose, rapid sequence induction would be a very high risk factor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it, is, a, it is a factor. Um, and uh, the NAP5 um, uh, report had uh, several of those, yeah. So we're monitoring our vapour concentration, of course, if we're using a volatile. Mm. If we're using Teva, uh, how are we going to be assured <laughs> that we have <laughs> <a> correct <laughs> anaesthetic well, dose? Well, yeah, we're going into a uh, conversation about um, EEG monitoring here, and um, uh, you, Mark, uh, have uh, somewhat... Um, uh, less enthusiastic view of <laughs> EEG monitoring than I do. I, I'm I'm in generally in favour of it, but but I have a problem too with it, and that is I'm not quite sure how to use it. Um, I get, given that there are manufacturers' recommendations about what sort of score the the BIS monitor or other monitor would would have, uh, I think the most important thing to do is to make sure that you. have got the anaesthetic in the patient. Now, if, it, if it's uh, an inhalational agent, then you've got the gas analysis monitoring to tell you that. If it's an intravenous agent, uh, you've got a problem, uh, but you should pay attention to the IV access, make sure it's connected, the thing's not extravasated, the pump's working, and you're giving a sensible dose. That's the first p- um, point. Second point, I think, is that uh, we do rely on um, heart rate, blood pressure, and other things that may not be related to depth anesthesia, they might be related to surgical stimulation, but they're still important. Intuitively, we feel that they're important. And so I, I pay a strong uh, attention to that. So that once I've got past those two things, uh, and I've got TIVA going, and I've got a muscle relaxant, the patient can't move if they were awake, then I think, uh, um, EEG monitoring or, or another form of monitoring may have a place, and I'm only using the word may because I don't know, but it intuitively it feels right that this is another level of, uh, uh, of checking uh, that whether your patient is or is not being affected by the anaesthetic. 
Uh, yeah, so sure. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to be able to uh, delve too deeply, thankfully, because you already have a PhD in the subject. I do. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, I know there are a lot of cynics like myself ab around about the value of uh, of BIS monitoring, mm -hmm. and uh, it may be, uh, I, as we were discussing earlier, it may be of benefit in for both the anaesthetist and also for the patient to know that you're going to be using something if you had a patient that had a, an experience of awareness yeah. uh, and you might be able to reassure them at least in part that you were going to be using this monitor yeah. uh, whether or not it's valuable as you say you know is still probably up for debate it is up for debate yeah, yeah. okay thank you um, now the other thing i wanted to say was uh, to discuss um, about what, what we might talk to, uh, explain to a patient beforehand. So quite commonly we are asked at our preoperative visit, uh, first of all, am I going to die under the anaesthetic? Uh, that's one anxiety that uh, ch children of a certain age come, uh, come up with quite frequently. And the other is, am I going to wake up? Uh, and so, I mean, uh, we're not going to be able to address the first one today, but the second one, what would you say to a, a child or, or parents, perhaps more commonly, that are asking that question? How can you uh, reassure them at the preoperative interview that, um, that uh, all is going to be well? Well, uh, I, I, th I think given that w one hopes we've got an ordinary patient here and then they haven't been aware in the past and they're not unduly, you know, they're not other good reasons to go down a difficult conversation about it. Uh, I think one would have to reassure them that this is extremely rare, very unlikely uh, to be uh, to remember anything that's distressing uh, during the anaesthetic, and you, you'd be able to uh, reassure them that the particular operation they're going to have does not involve the use of drugs that would keep them still, and that they would still be able to move if they were awake. Uh, it's important not to use the word paralysis. I think that's a an unhel unhelpful word um, uh, and uh, having taken them down that line um, you, then you also say you will have monitoring on uh, maybe you won't specify that it's EEG monitoring but you will have monitoring on to, to tell the anaesthetist that the anaesthetic is going in and you will definitely have an anaesthetist there standing next to you watching you all the time doing their level best to make sure you're asleep you know, I, th I think those are the uh, the good things to put in. If it gets more complicated than that, then uh, we, we're going going into a difficult area. Um, and uh, there are some people who've been aware in the past, and I think you'd have to take exceptional means to work out a strategy to uh, to minimise that. Okay, thanks. And um, just to finish, Mike, um, what would you uh, what would you do if if you had a case um, and uh, reported to you a patient volunteered at, at the end of the list that uh, you were asked to come and see them, perhaps that that they felt they were aware? How would you best take that forward to minimise the distress to the patient uh, for future anaesthetics uh, and and at the time, indeed? Yeah. Well. Um this would be a surprise, wouldn't it? A surprise uh, when you went to see the patient. Uh, probably the nurse would, um, the, the parent or the child would tell the nurse, and you'd find yourself being called back. Um, one you've got to be sympathetic immediately and uh, take the story and work out whether this has a uh, is truly awareness related to the the anaesthetic, or whether it's just a something they've remembered when they're waking up, as you'd hope. Um, you may find it is uh, what you hope it isn't, and that they were seriously aware. Uh, and then um, one's got to be be sympathetic and supportive, and explain what went wrong, or if it did, um, and uh, express regret and uh, not deny it. You know, all of those things that happened. At least those who denied the problem in um, in Nap Five, uh, I'm afraid, um, seem to make it worse for the poor patient. There were a lot of psychological problems where, uh, where the, the patients re reported that the anaesthetist wasn't sympathetic, so you know we can do that. Uh, now in children, hopefully, um, the memory, the thing that they remembered was, is, was not distressing, but, but it still might be. Uh, it might be that they associate the distressing memory with, with the anaesthetist themselves, so it may be that it might be wise to get somebody else to come and uh, have a chat with them and, and you may get a different story, you know, that's, that's a possibility. Um, 
and hopefully things will uh, be okay over the next few days. But if they have been distressed, then one has to consider if and when a psychologist would be needed. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, that's been very helpful. I hope uh, listeners have uh, have enjoyed it and it's brought the article to life. If they haven't read the article already, then I do recommend it. Accidental awareness during anaesthesia in children in paediatric anaesthesia. Thanks, thanks Mike. Mike. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>